I have to read from a script because uh, we're actually recording this talk tonight for um, website uh, access so that uh, we can make uh, the story behind the Moriyama Prize available to the world. And we're here tonight to celebrate that, uh, the story behind the Moriyama RAIC uh, International Prize and the wonderful partnership that has been forged between Raymond Moriyama and the RAIC, which is, of course, the advocacy voice for our profession in Canada. The inaugural uh, Moriyama RAIC International Prize was awarded in October 2014 at a gala celebration in Toronto at the new Aga Khan Museum. This biennial prize is open to all architects, regardless of nationality and location, in recognition of a single transformative work of architecture. It is among the very largest prizes in the world, for it carries a $100,000 Canadian cash award, plus a magnificent sculpture by Canadian and Edmonton designer Wei Yu. This is not a lifetime achievement award. That's what's so important for it. It's for a single project. It's an open competition. Anybody, young or old, can apply and have a chance of winning. The REIC received numerous submissions from architects around the world for projects located in a total of nine countries, including Canada, China, France, Germany, Israel, Japan, South Korea, the United Kingdom, and Tajikistan. The jury, whom I will identify in due course for you tonight, was impressed by the breadth of international interest and extremely encouraged by the high level of engagement with the aims and the objectives of the program. In addition, to emphasize the didactic goals of the competition and to make it even more unique around the world, and to, I guess, manifest our particular personal interests in educating the youth of this country, especially our future architects. Three $5,000 scholarships to students of architecture were awarded based on an illustrated essay competition and responding to the question, why do I want to be an architect? A simple question uh, and a separate jury evaluated an overwhelming 150 submissions from students enrolled in every one of Canada's 11 accredited schools of architecture. For such a question, for such a simple question, the depth and the wonder that the students took to the underlying meaning was very impressive with heartfelt and passionate views on the world of architecture. The winners are uh, Benny Kwok from Dalhousie University, who wrote about a building workshop on a secluded beach in Norway, with five students all speaking different languages. And they found a means to communicate with one another by drawing in the sand. Loic Jasmine from the University of Montreal, a Francophone, uh, from Haiti, wrote with uh, much passion about the earthquake recovery efforts uh, and his desire to be an architect because he felt he could change the world. And finally, Sophia Wu from Waterloo, uh, who wrote very eloquently about bettering the lives of those living in Yaodong, which are the cave dwellings uh, in China. Really, really compelling work. Tonight's lecture in uh, three chapters, so I hope that we can hold your interest for a while, is the first in what we're calling the REIC Illumination Series. This program will see a series of lectures that will be built up over and during the off years of the prize. The prize is offered every two years, so in the off year, we will be doing lectures across the country, delivered by each of the successive prize winners to all of the schools of architecture across Canada. Our winner of the inaugural prize, Li Xiaodong of Beijing, China, begins this journey later in 2015. Our goal with this lecture series, of course, is to build a legacy around this prize for both scholarly and for public consumption. So we try to set the table for you tonight by bringing you the backstory around the evolution of this very prestigious award. After the lecture, we'll encourage comments and questions from you. Uh, and hopefully we'll enjoy uh, food and uh, cash bar uh, reception outside the theater. So just a few words about uh, the origins of the prize, if I may. From the outset, Raymond Moriyama's vision for this award is intended for our global profession to aspire higher, 
to raise the stature of Canadian architects and of Canada itself. It has been shaped by Raymond's deep conviction that great architecture is transformative and that great buildings transform us by creating places based on shared values of humanity, respect, and inclusiveness, and also environments for the well-being of all people and, of course, for the planet. The conditions for the prize were very carefully crafted with the intention of framing the competition to reflect that vision. As a result, we find embedded in the basic terms of reference three guiding principles. Number one, it's a competition open to all architects, irrespective of nationality and location. Number two, it recognizes a single work of architecture as opposed to a life's work. And number three, it celebrates buildings in use. A range of criteria inform the juror's critical evaluation of each project. It's formal, spatial qualities. It's response to site, climate, culture. It's craftsmanship its environmental responsibility and design, and most important, its record of experience and use. For the jury, this emphasis on the consideration of the building in use, not just finished, but occupied for at least two years, differentiates this prize from the majority of architectural competitions around the world. How else can we judge the extent to which the building has not only served, but transformed its community. So what makes a good building transformative? In his book, Studies in Tectonic Culture, Kenneth Frampton describes the act of building in a language that resonates very powerfully and convincingly with the very intentions of the Moriama Prize. Listen to this, and I quote, situated at the interface of culture and nature, building, is as much about the ground as it is about built form. Its task is to modify the Earth's surface in such a way as to take care of it. At the same time, it is as much about placemaking and the passage of time as it is about space and form. Light, water, wind, weather. These are the agents by which it is consummated. Inasmuch as its continuity transcends mortality, building provides the basis for life and for culture. In this sense, it is neither high art nor high technology. To the extent that it defies time, it is anachronistic by definition. Duration and durability are its ultimate values." Unquote. So with all of this in mind, the jury worked very hard over a period of two days in Vancouver. We were attached at the hip, morning, noon, and night, to narrow down the selection of all of the submissions to four projects. In the discussion on the merits and the qualities of each, it became very clear that one project was in every respect exemplary in relation to the criteria outlined in the terms of reference for the prize. It's interesting, the deeper we got into the due diligence process, the more we fell in love with the winning scheme and the more distant the other schemes made themselves from it. Very, very interesting process. So following this period of due diligence that included much further discussion and site visits, the jury unanimously confirmed the choice of the winner, Li Xiaodong, for his Li Wan Library in the mountains north of Beijing. You'll see that later, and I will get to it in a bit more detail. But first, I want to bring Ray to the podium. Well, first of all, I should tell you that not many people will believe this story, but the history of uh, RIC, International Prize, goes way back. And without this history, um, the prize itself would not be uh, happening. There's a saying that God opens a door for every child. And he did so for me at age four. And it was a very painful one. Uh, I had a bad scalding uh, to about 40% of my body. And uh, I was confined to a, a, you know, with great pain and uh, to a bed for about eight months. And from this bed, I observed 
a construction going on, going on across the street. And it was, for me, a wonderful diversion because uh, uh, I thought this was a wonderful, enchanting castle that was going up. And uh, every once in a while, a prince would come along with a row of drawings and a pipe. And uh, everybody gathered around him, and every time he opened us the drawing and pointed to some drawing, uh, everybody would nod and smile. And I said, Dad, you know, they, they like this man. Now, who is he? So Dad went across the street and found out, he came back and said, he's called an architect. So immediately at that particular moment, I said, I'm going to be one too. <laughs> and so my career, the lifetime career was settled at uh, age four and a half. Uh, at age nine, uh, traveling on a tram from Vancouver to uh, New Westminster, uh, saw the city sort of moving, fleeting by, and I said, wow, well, I'm going to be an uh, urban planner and an architect of the city. And so uh, life was very simple. By the, by the age of 12, uh, uh, life for me was idyllic, although we were sort of you know, you know, having you know, all kinds of problems with uh, racial discrimination in Vancouver. And so the life was simple. It was almost a straight line. And then came uh, December 7th, 1941, and the world turned upside down. And uh, the, there was increasing uh, amount of discrimination against the Japanese Canadians, but the worst part was for the Canadian government to label all Japanese Canadians as enemy aliens. And that was painful. And for me, it lasted about 25 years. It, it was very difficult to get over, you know, having lost self-esteem. Um, and, and at the time, my father, who was a, a school teacher earlier, um, said, told me that he's going to fight the contradiction of Canada going to war in defense of democracy and individual rights. And at home, it's a total sort of opposite and a disaster, a black page in a Canadian history. So uh, he was virtually immediately arrested for refusing to be separated from my mother, who was pregnant. And uh, uh, he felt that men should not be separated from uh, the women. And uh, so I, I thought, you know, immediately, this man is my big hero. And so my dad became a hero, and it, in my mind, you know, an example to follow that there are contradictions that you don't fight, but there are contradictions that you fight for. Now, uh, we were all sent to an uh, internment camp, as some of you may know. And it, it, it was an absolutely uh, depressing situation for, for me. Um, uh, I hated Japan. I hated Canada. I hated my own Japanese-Canadian community. And, uh, you know, here without dad in distant Ontario in a POW camp. And my mother had just lost the only baby brother I could have had. And, uh, and the Japanese Canadian community was sort of pointing out to, oh, Ray Moriyama is, uh, you know, is disease. They used to think my scar uh, was 
a disease and they try to avoid me. So all along, all along I decided that I should uh, try and, and uh, do something about this. So I went to the river to take a bath because there were only two baths, public baths, and every time I went to the, the bathhouse, I would be sort of a taunted by, you know, not only young kids, but adults as having a disease that, uh, you know, people should avoid. So I went to the river on the other side of a mountain, Strokan River, and that's where I used to take a take bath. But what was wonderful was I started to realize that you know, nature was so beautiful. So my lookout platform that I made to wa watch myself from, you know, watch people coming, and especially the RCMP. I didn't want to be caught and uh, to be on the other side of the, the so-called fence and, uh, and maybe I rested just like my father. Uh, and what happened was the, the surrounding was so beautiful that the, the lookout became a part of the construction for a tree house. And the tree house, uh, I had to make it almost invisible. And the drawing you see, it shows it, you know, sort of uh, exposed, but it, it was relatively tiny and, uh, and, and I built it myself. Because if I had friends uh, helping me, I would surely be exposed to the RCMP. Uh, so I, was, I built this without being caught. And that tree house was, for me, heaven. It, it was a place of uh, sort of a solitude, peace, and, and a place to think. It was my university. And I started to see the wonders of uh, nature, how you know, all the pieces fitted together so beautifully. And in at, you know, the seasonal temperiness, uh, nature was so permanent and that it became a, a leaning post for me. And I used to sort of think, you know, you know, I want to be an architect, you know, what can I do, you know, now, but maybe what can I do when I grow up and be a Japanese-Canadian architect in Canada? Um, and slowly I started to recover from this despair and, and, uh, and I started to think of Canada as a, you know, a place that I, I must love and, uh, and became more attached to the Japanese-Canadian community. Um, and of course, uh, you know, as uh, Barry, Barry and David had mentioned, uh, uh, my parents had a great influence. And uh, my mother used to say, look, you always get back more than you, you receive. And of course, my dad uh, gave me a poem that sustained and propelled me uh, you know, into God's temple of eternity drive a nail of gold, you know, just one nail, but one force of gold. And uh, I guess <laughs> I must admit I'm still trying to do that. Uh, now, my last uh, 38 years that I've been thinking about this, uh, uh, this uh, a prize I started uh, back in 1977 or so and when I was 47 uh, I goofed off and with the idea of not having an objective no objective except to look after, look after the family and help 
Sachi and, uh, and listen to the kids. And I realized that, you know, when I was working, I did listen to the kids, but I wasn't really listening hard enough. You know, your, your, the mind's always occupied with, you know, what can I do to help the client? You know, that kind of thought. And so um, I spent six months just being home. And, uh, and I don't know if it helped the kids, but uh, uh, yeah. uh, we did listen. And, uh, and I found that uh, there were a lot of things I didn't know. Now, after six months, Satya said to me, you know, you, you promised that, uh, you know, that uh, until Ajahn reaches the uh, age of 13, you'll be home every night, which I, I did sort of uh, do. You know, I might come home and, you know, and eat breakfast, I mean, and dinner with them, put them to bed, and then I go back to work. And then in the morning, we get <laughs> to, back to home and have breakfast and uh, then go back to work. Um, it, it was, I start to realize that, uh, you know, uh, when Satya said, you know, well, you kept the promise and you've been home six months, why don't you go following the footsteps of a Buddha? Well, neither Satya nor I are Buddhists, but then, you know, after thinking about it, I said, okay, I'll, I'll do it. I'll do it chronologically, uh, starting as, a, as Siddhartha, uh, a prince, and later uh, as Buddha, until his, uh, he joined Parinibbana. So uh, I started off for India, but I didn't realize that uh, Buddha lived so long and, uh, and traveled extensively. So I ended up uh, walking 600 miles uh, in India. I was, ki I was nearly killed twice, but I did run into a lot of uh, religious leaders, religious historians, religious sort of people, and gurus, and, and people who were uh, sort of named as wise sort of people. And uh, so I, I started to learn a lot about uh, the spiritual uh, India, uh, you know, about Hinduism, Jainism, Sikhism, Buddhism. Uh, and it started to sort of open my eyes about what the world is uh, really about. It's not about creating nice buildings uh, with four facades, but there's got to be more, more than, than just a nice building. Um, so I, I thought I got to do something. And I realized that, you know, Canada uh, has, you know, at that time had wonderful architects, but we had a RIC, our national organization that I consider at the time as being a kind of a parochial organization that uh, the world of architects didn't really recognize. It was considered minor, just like they consider Canada as a kind of a minor, sort of a resource-oriented country that had nothing much culturally to, to sort of a provide the world. So I thought, well, I gotta do something. And I was thinking in terms of, you know, having a kick-ass kind of a uh, sort of program. And, uh, well, the, the problem I found at that time was that uh, I realized that you have to have a good program. You have to have some money to put into it. And it seemed that the timing wasn't right in 1977. So I thought, well, I'll do this uh, when I'm retired. And thinking that 
that there'll be others in you know, other thinking architects who will come in and, and present a really a good idea so I don't have to think anymore. You know, they'll accomplish what, I'm, what I was uh, thinking on my journey. Well, uh, nobody did come across. So I, I retired in uh, 2007, 2008, just between the two years. And then I spent four years gently sort of pushing and trying to convince people to think of this international idea. I was really surprised how, you know, the, the Canadian architects in general were, that they weren't interested in anything that's beyond the Canadian, you know, beyond Canada. And I felt, you know, really they don't understand the bigger picture of the future benefit. And, and because I, there was nothing I could do to prove that there's going to be a benefit in the future. And then I realized that, you know, kick-ass kind of a <laughs> program requires one person. A committee cannot do it, especially a committee from within the organization. So uh, in 2012, you know, uh, I met with Barry and and we had a really a good talk. And of course, uh, uh, he, had, he understood what the benefits were. And so uh, I was given a green light. And so in uh, Newfoundland, St. John's, I announced this uh, RIC, International Prize. Um, and I think uh, everybody did sort of uh, support it. Uh, and so I was really happy, and I think uh, Barry has given you, you know, some of the conditions and uh, criteria, so I won't go into that. And uh, so, uh, you know, uh, so in uh, 2014, uh, we finally had the inaugural uh, gala, uh, which, uh, in my mind, was a great success. Now we have pages of how to improve it for the next uh, round in 2016. And of course, the next round is going to be even more crucial than the inaugural. So uh, we're counting on that uh, and thinking about it, planning. And uh, in the meantime, as Barry mentioned, uh, uh, we're hoping that the Chardon will uh, give lectures across Canada uh, starting in the fall of this year. And uh, so uh, that's what has progressed. And of course, you know, in my mind, Canada is quite a distance from the golden Canada we're all aspiring for. And RRC has quite a long distance to go, too. But I think we, ha we have qualities in Canada that we could contribute a great deal to the world outside. And I think RRC, in my mind, could offer the world of architecture a, a spiritual quality that, uh, that will not only raise the aspiration of uh, world uh, architects, but hopefully it'll raise the aspiration of Canadian architects, which is maybe just as important. And of course, the young people's uh, scholarship are part of the crucial idea of, uh, uh, of uh, this prize. And of course, uh, um, I refer to the prize as RIC, International Prize, until you know, several people pointed out that it's not going to work. So we had quite a long discussion about that. And they said that it needs somebody else's name. 
Um, and they said, no, well, it should be you, as a, as a person who thought about it. So I talked to Sachi, who just absolutely refused, <laughs> because uh, you know, she said, oh, you're going to be a lightning rod, you know, and uh, the you know, warrior my name will, will be smashed up. <laughs> but uh, I have to agree with the, uh, the groups of people who recommended that the name uh, Moriyama be attached to this. So uh, this is how we came about to this particular point. But uh, uh, we need your support to move on and really make the, the next one uh, really a highlight because uh, I, I think the future benefit to Canadian architect is so fantastic and maybe it's hard to see that, but uh, uh, you know, I see a, a great potential, so I'm hoping we'll get your support. Okay, I'm going to call on a way you to carry on, <laughs> talk about the prize. One day at lunch, more than two years ago, Barry Johns asked if I was interested in designing the Moriyama RAIC Award. I was apprehensive because I was afraid to show my design ignorance to one of the masters of design, Raymond Moriyama. I asked Barry if I could take a few days to think about it. I was haunted by a fear. What if Ray hates it? My name would be mud. I started to read all about Ray and his works, his vision, creativity, compassion, and his spirituality. I was inspired. Well, nothing venture, nothing gains. So I agreed to expose my vulnerability. First, I researched the existing architecture awards given thus far. As you can see, most of the architecture awards are in the form of metal round pieces of gold, silver, or bronze. Not very much to impress an architect who is a design. Um, and secondly, I was wondering maybe by the same token, you don't want to do something sort of architecture to give it to an architect who says, wow, what kind of a design is this? So it's neither here nor there. And I also looked at uh, other prizes. In fact, the American Institute of Architects has this uh, famous uh, prize. So, and then I thought, well, is that all the awards are like? And then fortunately, there are some three-dimensional ones. The uh, concrete look looking like is the Sterling Award, which is very well known. And then this one surprises me most, which is the World Architecture Festival held in Singapore two years ago. And by the way, Lee Xiao Tong won that award on that project. But what kind of a award was given out? It's uh, the logo of the World Architecture W. And this is the American Design Award, which is, I think is pretty good, an asterisk. So I began the arduous task to come up with ideas. Six weeks later, Barry and I flew to Toronto to present not three, but five concepts. I met Ray for the first time in his office. And the first thing he asked was about our accommodation and how I slept the previous night. I was honest in my response and remarked that I was, well, up most of the night. Worrying, well, what if he hates all my five concepts? I then respectfully asked how was his sleep, in which he replied, not good. Why, I asked. I was wondering all night what ideas you would be coming up with. Of the five concepts I featured, I presented four using his name, Moriyama, which in Japanese means, and it's very good, forest, mountain. 
Here you have two Japanese characters for Moriyama. Incidentally, Yama means mountain, so Fujiyama means Mount Fuji. If you say Mount Fujiyama, then you are saying the mount twice. Um, <clears throat> his name is already a Canadian symbol. Mountain, forest, and this is typical of Canadian landscape. And if you notice, I have got a symbol of forests and mountains. I, I really can't draw, so this is my simplest way of drawing a tree, a forest, and a mountain. And after much refinement, the final piece became both architectural and sculptural, and reminiscent with visual metaphors. I decided to take half of the forest and enlarge the forest on the mountain and eliminate some of the branches. And now you have M as in Moriyama. The depth and light uh, and crystalline reflections that we see in this unique sculpture, which I'll show you in a moment, um, will come as you can see that. And when Ray saw this, he says, well, it's a little bit too symmetrical. Can we make it a little asymmetrical? No problem. In fact, in his presence, I shifted the two, the twin peaks to that. And he says, oh, good, that's it. Don't change anything. But he decided that uh, that is a very difficult thing to manufacture. So I added another line and making it four pyramids. And just look at that point where everything converges. And that is the tough part of it. So we had wonderful uh, model made, a cardboard version of the final finished product. And uh, Stephen Ellis, where, where are you? Yes, Stephen and his uh, partner, Jeff Bowden of uh, Ellis and Associates, who are, I think they're the finest model makers in town, uh, made that. And uh, Ray saw that and he says, why don't we make an acrylic version of this? So we did. And uh, I will show you this. Because it does not resemble the, the actual solid uh, crystal, but you can see it uh, glows like a beacon. So its quiet elegance is indicative of the qualities of humanity and humility of prized by Raymond Moriyama. The apexes on the four pyramids here, actually there are four, one, two, three, four pyramids, Coming together, the intersection of all this is a visual metaphor of convergence, as opposed to the other movie, Insurgents. The meeting of international talent with the spirit of working together for the greater good. It is also the gathering of all from the four corners of the world to celebrate the winner's work. And here, we decided that, well, Maybe the three dimension that doesn't work. It's just a model. And we decided now with this fabulous 3D printing, we actually had it made. So it works. And the, the point where all four of them come together, when you see a close up of it, it is actually zero pixel. But that is not very satisfactory. So I commissioned a 3D rendering made it from Maya and one of the teachers of uh, Guru Digital helped me do that. Then of course drawings are done and you, if you can see some of the changes there and there's a reason I'll explain shortly. So getting, getting a fabricator to produce a ward was a challenge. I spent eight months sourcing and talking to many glass artists in Canada and the US. This is interesting. I also contacted two well-known Bohemian crystal factories in the Czech Republic. That's how far I went. And um, 
no results, they're not interested, they can't do it. And Tiffany and, comp and company could make it if we allowed them to modify the design. And uh, neither did Corning Glass in New York and the Nova Scotia Glass Company. In Canada, a few from the East either not returned my phone calls or they commented that this was, quote and unquote, beyond the scope of service. Several crystal glass artists wanted to charge a lot of money without the assurance of a finished product. So finally I said I have to take it offshore. You know how much everybody says you take to China to do it, but there's no other alternative, but I took it to Hong Kong. My former employee, Gary, enthusiastically took the challenge of finding somebody to fabricate it. It took two at attempts before the final piece was made. Here is why. As you see, the challenges of this edge, sharp edge, resting on that plane is a challenge in itself, and here, he misses by two millimeters. So you, you have to understand that they all, they're not cast. You cannot cast a piece of glass or acrylic because you can't polish the inside of it. It's impossible. So you have to polish first after being uh, cut out from a solid rectangular block. And then you put it together and you pray to God, please, all the angles fit. But if you miss it by a little bit, then you miss it by a millimeter or two. And the other thing is here, all four points as they come to a zero pixel, and uh, this is what happened. Look at that when you sort of imagine they, this is a large size, weighs six kilos. Originally, the actual size, which is that one, was too big. It was weighing about 10 kilos. That's 22 pounds. Nobody is going to carry it. So I decided to take 10% off from the height, which of course reduced it to 6 kilos. So this is the best part. When all things are done, engraving the name of the winner on the sculpture is problematic. The copy will look backwards on all sides except the front view. If you look at this, this is great on here. But if you look at it on the inside, they're all backwards or upside down. So the internal reflections will cause visual chaos. So that's not good. Besides, the second one was more important. We didn't have enough time to engrave this in Hong Kong and bring it back in time because we only knew it about a month before the gala. So there was little or no time. And the most important thing was if there was a typo on the sculpture, <laughs> which is made far, far away, then we are dead. So how do we treat it? So I decided why don't we treat that building here this uh, sculpture like a building with a car shadow. And if you imagine, shadow goes through, and we take a portion of that, and then we engrave the names on it. So this means the winner can choose to place his shadow on either side of the building. Then the logo was designed for all press releases and media. And these are the photos of the final finish. As you can see, the Li Xiaodong's name is there. And you saw what is existing um, awards given so far. Now the world has a new architecture award. It is the richest prize to recognize a single work of architecture that is judged to be transformative with its societal context and expressive of the humanistic value of justice, respect, equality, and inclusiveness. Thank you very much.
Before exploring the Liwan Library with you uh, and describing this wonderful little building, I first uh, want to salute our inaugural jury. Uh, David Covo, fellow of the RAIC, former director of McGill University School of Architecture in Montreal, took on the daunting challenge of being our professional advisor and made it look easy. He presided over probably the best jury I've ever had the privilege to serve. Bing Tom, fellow RAIC, RAIC gold medal winner, Order of Canada, Vancouver. Patricia Patkow, fellow RAIC, RAIC gold medal winner, Order of Canada, Vancouver. Brian McKay Lyons, fellow RAIC, multiple Governor General Awards winner, Halifax. Maxime Frappier, RAIC, winner of the RAIC Young Architect Award from Montreal. And finally, from London, England, Ted Cullinan, honorary fellow RAIC and commander of the British Empire. Pretty high-powered international and national jury that uh, took this challenge on uh, and in a way was incredibly committed uh, to the terms of reference and we all held fulsome discussions around all of the entries. We explored well beyond the presentation materials that were provided and the videos that were submitted as well. We did due diligence research on the web. We phoned consultants. We phoned clients. We talked to users. We visited projects. We experienced both circumstance and architecture in full measure. The project submissions are not only found in nine different countries, including our own, they represent works across a very wide spectrum of architecture around the world today, from one extreme to the other. The object building that purports to change everything and everyone that it serves, to some very self-effacing projects that quietly look at the world with optimism and humility. We tended towards the latter rather quickly. While some of us attributed this to the underlying meaning of the terms of reference as defined by Raymond, others related to the ideals of being Canadian and our love as architects. For our rugged landscape, our regional richness, and our sense of place, we found, even in the best of the urban design work that we considered, a certain contemplativeness of place and site architecture that can truly enrich our lives. And so we made the case as a jury to speak very strongly that we need more types, more of these types of perhaps modest yet powerful buildings that make architecture from a deep understanding of people, culture, context, site, materiality, and light. The winning project, the Liwan Library by Li Xiaodong, a modest addition to a small village on the outskirts of Beijing, China. On the one hand, it forms a modern programmatic complement to the village by adding a small library into a setting of quiet contemplation. On the other hand, the architect wanted to use architecture to enhance the appreciation of the natural landscape. I quote from his submission documents. What I'm trying to do in my own practice might be described as a reflexive regionalism. It is more about identifying original conditions than inventing original forms. It's about combining technology, community, local materials, modern thinking, and a traditional sense of identity. This project is about the relationship of a building to its surroundings and its role in serving the community, rather than a building as a discrete object." Unquote. One of our jurors who visited the library as part of our due diligence exercise wrote, located in the mountains north of Beijing, this little library is beautifully sited. After 90 minutes on winding roads with views of fragments of the Great Wall in the distance, you emerge from the car and walk for a few minutes along a pedestrian path. The building slowly emerges from the landscape. You have a sense that it belongs and that it has always been there. Now Lee talked with us 
uh, and as well, uh, he talked with us during the gala, uh, but he also included uh, a very strong series of uh, images to depict the philosophy behind his critical thinking. As a professor, uh, he has the luxury of time to enable the ability to develop a very fulsome attitude towards uh, the application of his talents. And one of the first things that he talked about is that uh, in traditional Chinese architecture, reflected in their art and uh, the wondrous uh, symmetry of a lot of their early traditional buildings, is this reverence for nature. Uh, and it, it's reflected in many ways through uh, drawing uh, and also uh, through the types of buildings that you see in the traditional temples uh, and the courtyard houses that uh, define in many parts uh, several uh, decades, even centuries, of Chinese architecture. In recent years, he's taken the position that with increased urbanism uh, that has uh, occurred uh, throughout uh, China uh, and a massive importation of Western values, that uh, construction, of course, has, with an economy that has typically been burgeoning, happened ruthlessly everywhere without proper planning and uh, without, uh, and, and in a, just a desperate hurry. Nevertheless, the urban poor, many still live in chaos with failing infrastructure uh, and disadvantaged living conditions. So he sees China at a crossroads where from a social perspective, people are either being forced or choosing to leave an agrarian lifestyle uh, and uh, favoring or ultimately needing to join city life with all of its unplanned environmental consequences and serious air pollution in particular. He also sees China at a crossroads in architecture between tradition and modernity, the conflict between the East and the West, but ultimately a distancing from nature, which for him is a serious issue. And he has developed a very wonderful tongue-in-cheek image that kind of speaks to this dichotomy. And I think the, the, uh, uh, the combination of Chairman Mao and Marilyn Monroe uh, is a kind of uh, editorial statement on uh, the state of culture and the state of architecture in his uh, beloved country today. Uh, and he showed us what he declared examples of the ugliest buildings in all of China uh, to engender this uh, notion that rampant building without thought uh, and with random expression is not good for the lifestyle of people, particularly in a burgeoning urban and growing dense uh, existence. He also spoke at length about recent work where the object building uh, has found its way into modern China uh, and has yet to be fully evaluated. He also speaks of other projects which show Western influence, which are somewhat more respectful uh, of their surroundings uh, and deal with uh, more moderate conditions. And of course, he also speaks to the iconic. Uh, and for all of us in this room, we can make our choices as to which uh, of these models um, in the context of China, but frankly, in the context of the world of architecture today, uh, represents the most appropriate. But Lee's own work ascribes uh, to this reconnection to nature, a complex modern approach that he likes to call reflexive regionalism, where his work is totally respectful of its surroundings and uses all of nature as his building material palette. Examples of wood, water, stone, all come together in an extraordinarily poetic, uh, design oeuvre. This is a bridge school constructed in a very small village where there was a functional need to join two 
sides of a village separated by a river together. And he chose to do it not with a pedestrian bridge, which was uh, uh, the mandate, but developed it uh, instead as a school, as an extension of an, of an existing school on one side of the embankment. Very thoughtful, um, extraordinary uh, development. Um, no style, no prescription to a particular order, just extraordinarily beautiful and elegant and timeless. And finally, the winning project. The uh, Liwan Library exists uh, in an area no in the mountains in a small village of about 300 people north of Beijing. Uh, it is uh, a rather impoverished, I would say, village that um, uh, has little um, redeeming character, redeeming in the sense of architectural character. It's a village made of sticks and stones. Uh, and uh, bas basically uh, has the benefit of, of a river running through it, but that's about all. One of the major characteristics of uh, the village, however, is uh, the surrounding forest land, which uh, is comprised of really fast-growing but small trees, which are harvested and used as firewood. And so this becomes, in many ways, the essential language of the project, where these sticks allow the architecture of the library to become part of nature. And there's a real story behind this. The site in the mountains outside of the village is a lovely walk of about 10 minutes. Uh, and so because the library typically is seen as um, uh, the community living room, the idea of creating a transition to get there uh, was a compelling notion. Uh, and the sighting of the building uh, on this uh, river, uh, you can see here part of the construction uh, underway, uh, takes advantage of the water uh, as well, and you'll, you'll, see, uh, you'll see a little bit more of that in a moment. So here you have the story of the sticks, where these twigs have been uh, very carefully uh, inserted in a frame, uh, and that frame becomes the wrapper around the building. Very simple, uh, and it's intended to, uh, to age, uh, and so the building becomes one uh, with its overall environment. Part of its community, part of the essential characteristics of the village, you would not find this anywhere else. One of our jury members wrote um, a rather eloquent series of comments about the interior. Once inside, you find yourself in a single open space, defined by the ambiguous wooden frame, ambiguous simply because you read it simultaneously as structure and as a wall of bookcases. The complexity of the space is intriguing. It makes you wonder about things like good libraries do. Overlaid over everything is the delicacy of the wooden lines and the fractured light of the exterior wrapping. This layering creates a memorable space and a specific place within. Very simple box, articulated to the extreme, built to a scale that recognizes uh, young children as well as adults and everyone in between. The jury seriously appreciated the craft and the elegance with which this building has been sighted. The simple device of a raised walkway and crossing the river leading to the entrance makes the approach quite special. The mass of the library steps back to receive you, leaving the forward plane almost abstract or elemental. A delicate but decidedly frontal and textural presentation plane of wooden lines and fractured light. Within this abstract plane, the half-sunken concrete framed opening at ground level is both curious and suggestive. It provides the first hint of the sectional condition of the land. And it is this aspect of the project, the siting, that is perhaps its most appealing. It's also a building that recognizes 
its climate. Uh, and from uh, a sustainable design perspective, we are all talking about green buildings these days that's become in many ways the mantra of contemporary architects uh, around the world. Um, Lee barely talks about it. To him, this is just part of doing the right thing. Uh, and in this particular case, this building is not air conditioned. It's naturally ventilated uh, and air is drawn and cooled across the water of the river and distributed through a series of openings uh, and operable windows within the building to provide natural cross ventilation. Uh, in, uh, I should have mentioned initially that the climate in Beijing is not unlike our climate here in Edmonton. Um, we enjoy, as does Beijing, uh, Beijing uh, extremely dry and cold uh, winters. Temperatures are similar. Uh, and in the summertime, the only difference between our extreme hot temperatures and those found in the Beijing area is that they have much more humidity. And so a building that we would typically wish to air condition here in Edmonton would be the same kind of um, series of gestures that might be applicable in this particular area. In the mountains, where you're a little closer to the sun uh, and the air temperatures change much more dramatically, the issues of climate become even more acute. And so a natural cooling in the summertime through ventilation and using the natural uh, evaporative cooling characteristics of drawing air across water uh, is very effective. And in the wintertime, the glass roof, which is shielded by the sticks, provides a kind of greenhouse effect and enables solar radiation, which is very strong in the area because the air in this particular part of uh, the city, because it's up in the mountains, is a lot cleaner. Uh, and so one can actually capture the radiation of the sun much more effectively. And so the building effectively uh, conditions itself. It has no mechanical system except for a washroom. It has no electrical system. Uh, it functions off the grid. And uh, it basically has uh, created a series of lessons around uh, the true meaning of what an organic uh, architecture might mean. And to that effect, the idea of a living skin, uh, which is exemplified in these three slides, Lee sees the changing of the facade over a period of time uh, being reclaimed uh, by nature and effectively the skin ultimately being inhabited by the local birds and animals in the area. This is something that's being encouraged. So he sees the transformation of this very simple but extraordinarily beautiful and elegant building uh, slowly being absorbed by nature uh, and becoming even more a part of the natural surroundings than it was when it was originally constructed. To add, uh, yet another dimension to this idea of a library being transformative. Uh, it's open to the public. Uh, it's, it, it was intended to draw tourists, but they didn't expect that the impact would be as significant as it was. Uh, they've had to build a separate bus stop nearby to accommodate the, uh, the crowds that come mostly on the weekends. But people are encouraged because they didn't have any money to actually outfit uh, the library <clears throat> initially with books that visitors are encouraged to bring two books and uh, enjoy uh, their time and take one book with them. And so uh, in a period of two and a half years, the library has replenished uh, its collection many times. Uh, and it is now a completely multilingual library because tourists have come with books from their own countries. And so it has enriched uh, the culture and the exposure uh, of its own community through this library to the rest of the world. This photograph is Lee's favorite photograph. It's not an architectural photograph. It was taken by a, photo by a farmer uh, who, among many of the um, uh, people that live in the village, uh, was asked to just wander around uh, with the camera one day, in this case in the winter, to um, try and capture the essence of what this place might feel like during various times of the day. And I think this says an awful lot about uh, the way in which this building blends within its environment. But I'd like you to have a look at this next.
城市里的图书馆差别很大，呃，它首先很自然，在一个山村里面，然后在青山绿水的环绕之中。第二个，它这个空间里面呢，没有一点水泥、钢筋的影子，全是木头和柴火。当走进来的时候，大家都把鞋脱在门口嘛。然后当光脚踩进来的时候，有一种就像是呃自己回到家里面，第一步会先脱掉鞋，然后回到家一样，就是把所有的那些疲惫啊、压力啊全部都卸掉，然后一身轻松的进来，还可以一边读书啊，一边和和朋友交流，就特别的舒服。住北京，我是第一次来。我的孩子，我看他很喜欢在这儿爬，我觉得很舒服这个地方，因为都是木头，我很喜欢木头，然后，呃，在这个环境里面真好看，呃，很合适，就是我看不到那些书。<笑>过去大概三四个星期吧，基本上每个星期都来。今天是我爸爸还有我的大伯一起过来，他们也是第一次来。开始也没没看出是个图书馆，进来一看呢，这个、这个给自己一个很大的震撼。屋里边的采光基本上都是都是自然光，我而且很柔和，非常好。我觉得这个让大家都有一种参与的感觉，然后大家觉得好像一起在建设，呃，一个属于自己的小东西。我觉得这感觉还是很不错的，有一种归属感。下一次你来，你可能能找到说这本书是我捐的，因为这感觉很不一样。涉水翻了好几座山到这个地方来，没有想到在这样一个偏僻的这个山村里面，还有这样一个当代的建筑，而且这个当代的建筑在这儿又不显得突兀，反而跟这个大自然融合的非常的好。如果非要形容的话，我觉得它像一棵被掏空的大树，然后人们在里面就感觉被它包容，然后享受就这一片的这个宁静。这个场所本身呢，不光是从这个书内容本身，包括它这整个的环境，就是空间营造本身，都对小孩会产生一个积极影响。呃，因为这里面所含所包含的意义，它可能并不是那么直观的表达出来，或者它不能体会那么多。但潜意识里面，就这么样一个书屋的存在，以及书的内容也好，这个读书的方式也好，以及这个参与这些这个带来来读书的人的这种接触也好，都对小孩会产生一个长远的影响。潜意识里面。建筑是环境当中一部分，而不是独立的环境之外。所以，我们这个房子设计也是这个房子必须是环境的一部分。也就是说，房子对环境产生最小的这个影响力，而融入这环境当中。所以，它的材料选择以及它的形态选择都是用最简单、最直接、最自然的一种方法。就希望在多少年以后，当这种积累足够了以后，这个自然的过程会把这个房子变成一个，变成另外一个样子。这是我所期待的一个，就是建筑本身可以变成一种变成自然进化的一个过程，参与这个过程，然后也把我们中国传统的这个天人合一的这种这种思想，融化在一个当代建筑创作的一个过程当中。I think we should remember his name, Li Xiaodong, 55 years of age. He's an architecture professor、uh, at a major university in Beijing. He speaks English very, very well. Uh, he is in demand, although not well known around the world, and yet uh, has an, an incredible pedigree of achievement for a series of very small and modest buildings. And I think we will all be hearing more from him, and we certainly look forward to having him、uh, back in Canada、uh, to start the lecture tour、uh, later on this year.